best. First time. Cool. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I'm Nick Pinkston, the founder of Plethora, and, uh, and essentially we're making kind of a factory of the future where you put in files and then parts come out. So we sort of think of this in the same way as like cloud computing where you don't actually own the servers, you just put code in the cloud and stuff happens. We're essentially doing that but with a factory. So you can see a little bit of what happens is there's basically the sort of the, if you haven't you've seen like 3D design tools before, it's called CAD, computer-aided design. So we go inside of engineers' CAD design systems, and as they're designing, we tell you, like, hey, you shouldn't do that. It's not going to be possible, or here's how much it's going to cost. Here's what we can get it to you. Normally, this is done on the phone, um, but we do it in real time as you're going, sort of like a debugger. So I'll talk a lot more about this later, but I think we got to go back in time, as she said, to, like, the Model T. And I think it's funny that you come into a factory today. How many people have actually been to a factory? Maybe I'm in them. Okay, people actually have. Okay, cool. I never know if I'm some weird outlier. <laughs> I just go to factories for fun, and no one else does. So I'm glad we got some factory going. Um, if you go to one, you know, there's basically these like belts, and things are coming off belts, and they're all the same. And this is like the great thing of mass production is, is that you can go and you can take something that normally would have taken someone forever to do, but you can pound them out like one every minute, and then they're super cheap for everyone. That's great. But if you want to make one of something, it's super expensive. So like a lot of my friends, we've got hardware companies, and the, un the thing like software, you can change settings on your site, redeploy, see what people think. You know, it's very nice, the whole like agile development thing. Hardware isn't like that. You have to have everything set up beforehand. If you make like one mistake, you're screwed, and you spent like a couple million dollars to set up this factory, and no one wants any of the stuff you made. So essentially, what we're trying to figure out is how can we make hardware just like software um, in this ease of sort of agility. And so one of the problems is this complexity. So this is just like the engine of your car taken apart. There's a lot of freaking parts in here. And unlike software, where if you change one piece, it kind of all works-ish, um, if you change like where the bolt is on the engine, the entire thing has to be redesigned. And that means all the molds you made and all that whole factory system you made has to all be redesigned. So it's like one change takes a million dollars. And so you just don't do it. And so the product life cycle, unlike software, where you can do like daily deployment, this is like annual deployments, like a car. Like you don't get many new cars because it takes so long to figure out all the different parts. So, you know, a lot of people are wondering. So the, the intro was about 3D printers, and I love 3D printers, but uh, it's sort of one tool in the box. Like, there are actually many different kinds of 3D printers. There's like, I think, 20 different kinds of 3D printing from like metals and ceramics and glass. There's all sorts of cool stuff. You could even print in flesh now. They print organs. It's pretty nuts. But, um, you know, I like to think of manufacturing more as an ecology. So like, we're not going like, to reduce into this one thing, the 3D printer that produces everything. We're going to have all these little different processes. This is just how steel works, from like, the ore in the ground and scrap all the way to cars and all the products that we buy coming off the line. It's very complicated. And to do so, like, everything is very specialized. And like, this is what manufacturing actually is really good at, is making a very specialized thing and then efficiently making all the stuff we make. That you know, A blacksmith could not make your car in like, a million years. Like, it just be possible without all the specialization. So I think that everyone in the 3D printing, the hype in the media is that 3D printing is going to be this like, you know, Deus Ex Machina, Machina, um, but it's not. It's, it's actually just one cool thing that we can do now and it's going to keep doing good things, but we have to think about the rest of manufacturing more holistically. And so if you look at all these different processes, so I mean, you have additive where, you know, 3D printers, they add material until the product comes out. Um, I deal right now in things called subtractive, which are the opposite. That's in the middle. That's where you take like a block of something and you remove move what you don't want, and then the part you have is left. And uh, you know, all, there are all the different ones. We have to automate all of these. And so I sort of see like the future of manufacturing is not any one process like a 3D printer, but taking that interface that a 3D printer has, this like push button interface, which is so nice, but making it work with everything else. So like the question is, how do we make the sort of traditional manufacturing processes? How can we make those processes as easy as you know, software or 3D printing? And I think that there's sort of some cultural reasons why manufacturing is so kind of old like this. Um, there's, I'd like to think of this continuum of engineering conservatism. So uh, software is something where you can write it, deploy, debug in real time and at almost at no cost. So the, the, the whole point is like you compile your code, you see what goes on, and the bugs let you actively develop. No, no other industry really gets this other than software. Like electrical, you've got to make a board. Boards are, you know, they're not super expensive, but it's still a lead time you have to go out, so you try to make sure all your changes work. Mechanical, it's a lot of money to make, you know, the whole car as a prototype, so you better get it right the first time. It sort of leads to conservatism. And in civil engineering, if the bridge doesn't come 
come out right the first time, you're fired, right? Like it's not going to work in civil. So there's not a lot of innovation in these things. We build bridges like we did like 100 years ago. And so I think that software tends to be like on the forefront of engineering thinking in many ways. I mean, we borrow a lot from all the fields, like lean came from manufacturing first. But still, I think software is a good place to look for a lot of models and sort of the theme of this conference of models we can apply not just to software but to all kinds of engineering. And that's sort of what I'm interested in doing at our company is the sort of standard cycle of software development. We basically have made each one of those um, as a system for hardware for our company. So I'm going to go through and show you sort of like what this looks like in the wild for what we do. So, so firstly, this is like a blown up version. The thing, let's see, does this work? Yeah, there it is. So this thing is a, is a plugin inside a CAD software. And you can see it does a couple things. Like one, there's like this red stripe here and the different holes are kind of highlighted telling you, hey, we can't do this. This isn't possible. And over here it'll say, like over here, like the thread's too deep. The holes cannot be that deep. We can't do it. And this thing knows like the entirety of our factory. Like it knows all the drill bits we have. It knows how big the machines are. It knows all this stuff. And it gives you feedback as you're doing it, kind of like a debugger gives software guys feedback. And then once you hit buy, then we can, uh, we can go into our system, which basically programs the equipment. So, you know, in software, we're sort of, you know, used to programming something and then it just happens. In manufacturing, you design something in 3D and people take like days to program the equipment to make one part. And your whole thing might be like 50 parts. So you've got like so much time and so many man hours to just get this thing going once for the prototype. Um, it's very expensive, very slow. So what we did is we basically took like essentially the mind of those manufacturing engineers and we put it inside of the computer. So we just send the file to our system and the system actually figures out how to make it automatically. And then it generates from, this is like the 3D file. This is the like carving paths. And so this thing, this is a, a, what's called CNC milling, which is like a carving machine. This, these are the paths that the cutter takes. And normally that's all hand programmed by someone. And then this is actually on the, on the right, a simulation of that. So it's sort of like tests in software where you do like unit tests or whatever to figure out if you did everything right. We do the same thing in hardware. We test to see if we made the part right. And we then compare the part you designed with the part you want to make. And then we say, OK, cool, that makes sense. And then run it on the machine. So then we deploy. And so, you know, we like to think of the thing on the right is, a, is the milling machine. That's like the kind of machines my company uses to make like metal and plastic things. And on the left is a server. And you can see there's one big difference is like, yeah, of course they produce different things. One's bits, one's atoms. But, you know, the screen. These machines are designed to have a person in front of them. Even if they're automatic, a person is still sitting there, like programming them and maintaining them. Servers don't do that. They're just sitting there. And yeah, there's someone in the, in the data center, but you know, they're not supposed to be right in front of it. And I think this is the, you can see like the mentality of the industry kind of leaking through. So we like to treat our machines like they're servers. They're just sitting there. I like looking out at our factory and I just see all the green lights on the machines and I'm like, cool. And there's no people out there. They're just producing stuff automatically, um, which is, I don't know, I think that's cool. And, and it lets us like basically dynamically reprogram the machine. So no people have to go out there and start wrenching on anything. We just hit a button and it just deploys it and the parts come out. That's essentially what's going on. And so this is the actual process. So CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control, because back in the day, computers were kind of, whoa, in like the 70s, and they thought that was really cool. It basically just means computer controlled. And milling is, you can see the like little, this thing that's spinning really fast is kind of like a drill bit, except it can go sideways too, and it carves out material on these machines. So that's, that's currently what our company does, but we plan to expand into other processes too. And then after you make it, this is, a, it's called a CMM, a coordinate measuring machine. We can actually touch the surface is the part and then inspect if we actually made it after the fact. So, you know, we debug, we then simulate it, and then we test it after to see if we make it. This is sort of like how software does the same stack, so then we can confirm the parts are good. And that's done automatically, too. Normally, it's a lot of handwork to do that. Um, this is our goal. So like in everyone's town, most likely, you've got a pizza shop, which is like a just-in-time manufacturing facility where you get like a custom pizza with all the parts you want on it, you know, just in time. And so we basically think that, that hardware should be the same thing. Like you should be able to just like call them up, or in our case on the internet, hit go, and then it just comes out fully formed. And so that's essentially what like the kind of factories are building. We can go from a file to a part, you know, in the mail or in your hand in like an hour. Um, so we're not quite 30 minutes or, uh, or it's free, but you know, we're getting there. And that's the goal. So hardware can really be as easy as software as the goal. 
Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of what we're working on. I want to kind of just go into like the grand future, um, things that are just interesting that maybe people don't know about. And one of them is, so this CAD software is really freaking expensive now. It's something like five to 10 grand for a, uh, um, for a seat of CAD. And it's really hard to learn too. And so people are figuring out like how to put this on the internet. So this is actually a browser and mobile based CAD system, which is I think maybe like 50 bucks a month or free if, if you want to like, you know, do it for not a much. And so this will let like everyone have CAD. So I'm really excited to see when Onshape, these are the guys doing it, um, you know, actually get more out to the market and we see a lot more coming from them. I'm, I'm super excited about having cloud for everyone because right now it's just inaccessible. Software is great because you can just download anything for free. Um, it's so beautiful. Hardware is like inaccessible. Another thing are, you know, we have GitHub in the, in the software world where you store all your software and you do, you know, versioning and everything. We don't really have that for hardware, but we do have these libraries that, um, that allow you to download like bolts and screws and stuff. So that's, a, that's like sort of like open source. And I think that sort of the battle for the next like 10 or 20 years is making sure all those components that we can draw on are, uh, are you know, open for everyone. Because right now there's a lot of stuff you buy that you can't, you have to design it yourself. That kind of sucks. Has anyone, you, everyone ever, like, ever have a key, CT scan before, like on yourself? Um, and you can see like a 3D model. There's actually the industrial version of this too. So, and you can shoot a lot more X-rays through dead things, you know, than human things. So you get a lot better images actually. And you can actually figure out like the materials inside and everything else. So this is actually the CT scan of a, uh, a remote control. And you can get these to like fractions like of a millimeter, like the, the definition. So it's actually very clear. Um, and we can turn this thing around. And what, what I imagine is in the future, we'll have things like machine vision, which can actually look at these files and figure out like, okay, Here's what the circuit board looks like. Here's what the components on the board look like. And we'll be able to reverse engineer almost like we're, you know, like just it's open source, you know? And I'm, I'm interested in like in the future IP of hardware, it's almost like all of hardware is open source already because you get it. So once you get it, you got the source in a sense, and then we can just pull out what it is. So then how will companies, when you can just instantly take the IP from a, uh, from a controller, how can they protect what they're doing? If you're doing hardware, I mean, already I go to Shenzhen, China, where like 80% of the electronic are made. They're already doing this manually, um, and they're amazing at like turning this stuff around and then adding stuff to it. It's amazing. So I think this is just going to continue into the future. Um, and another big trend that, that we see is dematerialization. I love this term. Um, this is not my origination. I forget the guy who did it, but um, they have this slide where it's sort of like all the things in your smartphone that are, you know, were hardware that now are software. And I think that a general rule of thumb in the hardware world, because I see a lot of hardware companies, I'm really involved in that community. And you know, a lot of the times I'm like, wouldn't this just be a, an app? Like, don't you just, don't, could you just put that as an app? Like, I think we don't want to have all this landfill in the future by making all this hardware. So I don't want to say I'm super biased towards everything should be physical. I don't think that's true. I think everything should be software if it can. But you know, a lot of times you get to sense or actuate the world so if it's not possible. But I think that this is a great trend. So we can actually start having kind of more with less. And then sort of on the material side, we're doing the same thing. So instead of using like a big lump of metal and then cutting it out, the 3D printers on the top here actually make this kind of like webbing that actually is as strong or stronger than what you would use before, but you only use a fraction of the materials. And often there's some really interesting performance properties. So we're actually able to make the same thing, but we're able to make it out of far less material. And then you can also just buy it off the shelf. This thing is like a kind of sheet of aluminum, but the inside is actually foamed aluminum. So the outside is kind of solid plate and the inside's foam. And you can do this to make something that's a lot lighter and it's also pretty much the same strength as that panel would be, um, but it's off the shelf. You don't have to 3D print it because 3D printing is currently kind of expensive. So you just buy this. So I'm really interested to see the, the future of the dematerialization as like kind of everything kind of ephemeralizes, as they say. And well, I think we'll be able to design like more and more products that are both cheaper for people, better performance, and it'll be more you know, accessible for everyone. Because this is really my goal, is engineering superpowers. Like, I really like the ability of like, Iron Man in the movie, right? It was like, you could actually design this whole suit and it seemed really crazy, right, in the movie. But we actually are like, huh, we could actually do a lot of those components in like that sort of time. And I think the future actually kind of looks like the Iron Man design system. Like, that's essentially what I want the future to look like. So we're trying to build that. <laughs> so, um, you know, yeah, seriously, we're trying to. It's a, it's a long task. Um, anyway, so uh, thanks for having me out, guys. I really appreciate it. And uh, I don't know if, if I'll be outside if anyone wants questions. I'll be in the back. So thanks.